Today is April 22nd, 2018, and my name is Sue Barman, and I'm here with Barbara Hansen, and we are at the San Diego, Con San Diego Convention Center uh, for part of the annual meeting of the American Physiological Society. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure to be able to be here to interview Barbara for as part of the um, Society's Living History Project. So Barbara has been a member of the APS since 1978, and she's currently affiliated with the University, with the University of South Florida. She's been there since 2005. Her research has a very impressive career on research addressing the physiological, cellular, and molecular properties of, of disease states like diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and her animal model has, throughout her career, been non-human primates. And her work is very much translational, and she can relate it very much to human diseases that these, that these uh, rhesus monkeys also get. And so, Barbara, welcome to the Living History Project, and thank you for agreeing to be interviewed so that you can share your wondrous adventures as a physiologist with today's physiologists and, and being recorded like this for the history of physiologists. So, well, welcome. Thank you for the invitation. I think it, it's a great project, and I've looked at a few of them, and it's really interesting. All right, very good. So, um, tell me a little bit about what brought you to become a physiologist? So tell me about your family background, your parents. Did they inspire you to become a scientist, or how did that happen? My father was an aeronautical engineer, and in those days that was very advanced. In fact, his major project was a secret one, the U-2 project. Okay. Gary Powers crashed, and that's when we learned what our dad's secret project was. Very interesting. Yeah, and he, uh, he was with Pratt & Whitney, and they did the engines for that. So he was always a very um, quantitative person mm -hmm. and, um, and a, a Scandinavian. Okay. Uh, my mother was totally the opposite. <laughs> she was 100% housemaker, homemaker, I guess they called it in those days. Uh, and dedicated to her two children, mm -hmm. for which I thank her. Uh, she uh, had to drop out of college because of the Depression and made good and married a fancy aeronautical <laughs> engineer, and uh, the rest is history. So okay. they had two children. I have a brother a year younger. Okay. And so what inspired you to become a science, to enter science field? Oh. I didn't. <laughs> I started, uh, well, I was an exchange student in high school to Germany at 16. And then when I got to uh, college, I thought I would be a political science international relations major. So that was my major, Okay. my first two years. Then I went to India on a project in India, spent a whole summer in India. And I thought to myself, I don't think that I could marry and take my husband off to India or wherever else I might get a sign. I was picturing foreign service. And I talked to my very concrete father and he said, well, you can be a teacher. I said, I don't want to be a teacher, <laughs> which of course is what I am and what I have been, but that wasn't my goal at the time. Uh, so I switched uh, while I was in India, actually, to nursing because I thought, oh, this I could do any place, follow any husband around any place. Uh, and I got my bachelor's in nursing, and then I decided to go to graduate school. And they had a brand new program at UCLA, which you've never heard of because I'm the only graduate of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, this is really true. It was on um, chronic disease. Wow. And no one was interested in studying chronic disease. That's absolutely amazing. They did not, they could not, re they had the money for the curriculum, they had the money for faculty, the faculty developed the curriculum. I entered the program directly from my bachelor's like the next week, and I finished and they never took in another student and never had any others, because they could not recruit students to an interest in chronic disease. And I didn't know how much that would be the route of where I went, but basically I study chronic disease and have exactly. ever since. Right. Uh, so I was very much broad in my background, as you can tell, with political science. So I went into the psychology department at UCLA, and I took something called physiological science, physiology, physiological psychology. That sounded interesting, mm -hmm. 
But after the first year, <laughs> my husband was very planned, and he got assigned to Fort Dix, New Jersey. <laughs> okay. And I'm sorry to tell you this, but you couldn't go on the internet and look up Fort Dix. <laughs> and you definitely couldn't look up the universities nearby. So I spent a couple of weeks in a regular library <laughs> looking at college catalogs, Catalogs. if anyone knows what that <laughs> is. They're pieces of paper put together. And I found this interesting place called Institute of Neurological Sciences. And it was at Penn, and it was about an hour drive from Fort Dix. And this was the first week of August. But fortunately, I already had a five-year fellowship that was portable. So I called the, the director's office and talked to a lady. She was very nice. And she said, oh, you can call Dr. Steller at the beach. He's at the beach. I said, he doesn't know me. I couldn't possibly call him out of the mood. She said, just tell him what you told me. <laughs> so I did, and only Elliot Steller could have done this. I will tell you, I'll tell you more about him, but he was my first mentor, my first real mentor, and he, he said, well, young lady, he was always very sweet, <laughs> classes are starting in another week, so I think you should just pick out what you want to go to and start going, and I will be back after Labor Day, <laughs> and we'll work out the paperwork. <laughs> and he was good. He and, was good to his word. And so was he your PhD mentor then? Well, I only stayed there two years. Okay. So he, uh, he was very much my scientific father. Okay. No question about that. Um, but Fortix was ended in two years. They were two-year terms. Okay, okay. And um, so we looked around, my husband and I, for places that we both would fit. And I was at that point three years into my doctoral program. <laughs> but with no real degree or anything, just doing what I was doing research. I always call it a pre-doc because I spent most of that two years doing research. Okay. I took, filled in with some classes. And what kind of research were you doing when you were there? Regulation of appetite. Okay. And um, that was Elliot Steller's um, forte mm -hmm. and his, his research. Anyhow, he connected me to one of his own previous postdocs, who at that time was the associate director of the Primate Center at UW. Okay. And I'd never seen or heard or touched a monkey before, but I thought it sounded great because my human volunteers, by the way, I've studied humans three times, and my human volunteers didn't want to do what I wanted to do to them, <laughs> <laughs> which was place a cannula in their stomach chronically, like not just 24 hours. And monkeys made wonderful subjects for studying appetite regulation. Okay. And the only time I've gone back to humans the only time is when we made a discovery in monkeys to which my colleague endocrinologist said, oh, but that, isn't, that doesn't take place in humans. And I thought, hmm, that's highly unlikely. <laughs> so you proved that person oh, yes, wrong, so I did, I'm sure, right? <laughs> so I did the human study myself, yes, twice. And otherwise, I can only say this, monkeys are such a wonderful model for humans. Some people laugh when I say it, but they're a better model for humans than humans are because you have so much better control of the environment. Mm -hmm. You have complete control of the diet, and they don't drink alcohol the night before. <laughs> <laughs> they don't come in with a headache. And you have just, you have little beings that have about 98% the same physiology. I like to say they have tails and fur, but otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> they're Otherwise humans. they're humans. Yeah, Otherwise. and so all of my research over these 40 plus years has confirmed what we learned right away, that they are so similar to humans, just so similar. I just wish there were a lot more primate researchers because we are going astray with so many of our rodent studies, so many drug studies. I've done a lot of drug studies in my career, and so many of the ones that skipped primates failed. Yeah, and um, and I'm convinced it's the model. And in We've general, had, if they make it through the primate, does it usually end up being good therapeutically for humans? We have had two drugs in monkeys that did not have efficacy. Okay. We declared no efficacy, but they went for various different reasons into humans. And in one case, I got called to consult. It's about four years later. I thought they were calling me to talk about why my monkey results didn't match their clinical trial results. Mm -hmm. The person inviting me didn't know 
that I had done a primate study on the same drug. Oh, very interesting. And okay. learned about it in the course of the conversation. And what they were doing was trying to find out why it didn't work in humans. Humans, and uh, that's very interesting. It's and it, you knew true. it didn't work in, in the primates. Yeah, I figured they, they just wanted to pick my brain on my <laughs> primate study, which was not at all true. Only the rodent people knew that we'd done a study. So only um, the, the studies that we've done that have have gone into humans that were not efficacious for only two. And no one has ever put a drug that was toxic in the monkeys, mm -hmm. knowingly toxic, Correct. into humans. We had lots of efficacious drugs, many of which did go into humans, but some of which didn't for business reasons. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Me Too was too close or financially too much to make enough drug or whatever. Mm -hmm. There were a hundred reasons why drugs may not progress, mm -hmm. but they didn't fail in the monkey mm -hmm. ever and then make it in a human. So were so. these drugs, drugs that were designed to treat diabetes or obesity or metabolic disorders? All of those, all of, all of so the above, you, yes. exactly. Um, we started with some that we hoped would decrease appetite okay. mm -hmm. and have studied really Obesity, appetite drugs, diabetes drugs, and diabetes complication mm -hmm. drugs mm -hmm. all my career. Okay, all right. Yeah. Those were all industry funded. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not funded, carefully not funded <laughs> by NIH. Correct, yes. yes. And so you got your PhD then from University of Washington while you were yes. there then. So you, yes. so, so you were there then for just a couple of years, to, years to finish yeah. your, to do your PhD research. Well, the, the PhD at Washington was the only joint program that I know of. Steve Woods and I graduated together. He's also a member. Mm -hmm. And the degree was in physiology and psychology. Okay. And so mm -hmm. when I arrived, I took one exam and the other I took a few months later because I really had been studying that package right. so, for you, three years. Yes, right. <laughs> so so um, I went right into doing research on monkeys right away. Okay. and. Um, and wrote my first grant right after I finished <laughs> and went on the faculty there and stayed. Yes, and so, so then um, you, so you, so you didn't do a postdoc, as you said, maybe because you did the pre-doc, because you spent so much time learning, and obviously one of the functions of a postdoc is to increase your experiences and your field of interest, and you and had that design opportunity. design studies and, and analyze them and carry and, them out and, and write them up. <laughs> and you did that yeah. even before you got your PhD. Yeah, you had a variety of experiences. Kind of an unusual yeah. approach. And, and so um, you were, then you stayed at Washington for about five years, four or five years? About five, yeah. yeah. And I was a joint appointee between uh, the College of Medicine Physiology Department and the School of Nursing Physiological Nursing okay. Department. So, I so had make use of your your bachelor's degree in nursing. Did you ever I practice never nursing? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I didn't. It's almost embarrassing because I haven't even had a nursing title for more than forty years. But it really was uh, a fruitful way to begin. Sure, I got yeah. a very broad introduction to clinical medicine mm -hmm. and then physiology and psychology and. I kind of believe this world is complicated mm -hmm. and that having both behavioral and physiological approaches at the same time mm -hmm. is useful. At least it was in yes. my, oh, yes. in my yes. study. That's very good. And, and then you took a value of an opportunity to go to University of Michigan. So you did a lot of traveling over the, over the U.S. To, for your jobs and your, and your training. Um, and so tell me a little bit about life in Ann Arbor. Well, Ann Arbor was very different from the University of Washington. Um, much stronger in diabetes at that time. Mm -hmm. Now I think they're pretty comparable. Mm -hmm. They both have very strong diabetes programs. But at that time, uh, uh, Michigan was really strong. They had a diabetes center headed by Steve Fyans. And they welcomed me into the diabetes center the day I walked in. Excellent. And I found some more mentors and collaborators. and. Uh, uh, wrote a second grant. I, I already had two grants when I arrived, two R01s. Wow. <laughs> Which you, you had asked, two R01s before you arrived at Michigan. Yes. The, if I had advice to any young faculty member, it would be don't stop with your first, get your second, second. and okay. have them offset. Right. And that's right. what I did. Yes. So uh, they were offset by a year, and I moved both of them. Okay. And that certainly helped in every way. <laughs> and, and so, um, you actually also took on a, sort of an administrative role while you were at in Ann Arbor. So, 
So you were the uh, dean for research there? I was, and I also, that's where I got involved in the politics of science. Okay. And So back uh, to your interest in science policy for that while. Exactly. Yeah. It does, tra it traces exactly to Michigan. And um, I really got interested in, in promoting uh, research funding and in advocacy and uh, through one of those calls, I got to know Don Fredrickson, okay. who was then the director of NIH, okay. and then I got put on his director's advisory committee, and that gave me even more breath. So I've always been a person with lots of interests mm -hmm. and uh, fascinated with how broad science is. So. And what absolutely fascinates me, I mean, I think you've had this absolutely remarkable career, but I am extremely impressed by the fact that 10 years out of your PhD, you got a phone call or a letter announcing that you were being admitted to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Tell me about when you learned that and what that must have meant for you at that really young age to get that extreme high honor. Well, first of all, I would say I didn't appreciate it. I did not have any idea how nice it was. <laughs> I was just doing my thing, and I, I got to know some of the right people, including the director of NIH and others, and I was on study sections mm -hmm. um, at that time. And um, it was just a big surprise. I really had no expectations. In those days, you didn't get told you were even nominated. Mm -hmm. Now today, it's very different. The okay. nominees really help with their nominations, okay. and they know who their nominator is and their co-nominator. And but in those days, it was all secret. No, you didn't even know anyone. You didn't even know what it was, let alone <laughs> what you were being nominated for. So, and I got active right away. Okay, I, I was on the program committee about a year later, and and that kind of helped because I got really involved very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fast forward quite a few years from that, from your initially getting appointed, we actually kind of met because of your involvement with the Institute of Medicine when, when the APS was interested in trying to get more of its members selected for it, and we right. met with you. I met with you in China in 2012, we, we figured out, right? Yeah, and uh, right. and um, so I've just been fascinated by, by the fact you are very, very active in helping get members in. and and helping APS members and other members um, getting involved with many of the very important activities that, that the National Academy of Science and Institute of Medicine so carry right on. So right about that time, just before we met, um, I became the vice chair and then the chair, the two year mm -hmm. terms of each, of the physiological, pharmacological, neuroscience, and in those days, anatomy, the anatomy's now gone, um, section. And that put me into a role of really knowing how you get to be a member, <laughs> which I had no clue. Even when you're a member, you really don't understand the operations that well. And, um, and that's when I realized that physiology as a discipline was greatly underrepresented. And I think there's some, it sounds bad, but some self-perpetuation mm -hmm built into the NAM because the sections are made up of the people that are in. Correct. Not yes. the ones who might come, come in. in. Right. And so I, um, I began working with Marty Frank to see if we could identify really good candidates and get the right nominator. Some of them were me, but not all of them by any means, and, and try to increase the presence of physiologists. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm kind of committed to the integrative science and physiologists very much that. And uh, so we, uh, we've been working on that, and Phyllis Wise is now the coming in chair. The, my vice chair took over from me, and Phyllis is now coming in as chair. And I'm sure that she's going to continue to promote physiologists. But we really have to have faculty who get involved at the national scene mm -hmm. anyway. Right. Study sections, organizing conferences. Um, political action, and I don't mean real political. I mean, I mean policy and NIH right. lobbying and National right. Science Foundation lobbying, things right. like that. Right. So, I think that kind of activity is often 
shed sideways, especially for assistant and associate professors in my career when just the opposite. I, I leaped into that part as well right away. Right, I'm impressed by the fact that some of the graduate students nowadays have a really high interest in science policy at a very young age. It's like, you know, when, when I was growing up, it was just unheard of that a student would go to, go to Capitol Hill and advocate for funding of science. And now, of course, APS is very much involved in helping those trainees and stuff get, get, get that experience. And some of them are probably going to really be very helpful to the future of Absolutely. physiology and If they and had anything like that back then, I never heard of it. Right. I don't think there I, was. Yeah, no. I never heard of I never was invited as a trainee to go to, go. <laughs> to Washington to lobby. Right, but, right. It was, uh, only, it was only the big folks that were allowed to do that kind but of now stuff. Now, you remember my first major. Yeah, science, science. Political science. Yes, yes, exactly. So, yeah, so I think so that's what I said for you. I think it, it really, it, you, you have an interesting background because you have not just the science background, but the political science background. Right. And so you've been a good advocate for science for a long time yeah. and, and um, leadership roles in various organizations. Um, you've, so you've been president of several societies, right? Um, the Obesity Society, I was the first president. The, 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 the North inaugural American. Pres president, yeah, the first yes. One. Uh, and then I actually set out with my collaborators in Europe uh, to form the International Association for the Study of Obesity. Okay. And I chaired the formative committee. Cool. My husband, who's an attorney and a physician, uh, helped me. The two of us wrote the bylaws, wrote the bylaws. for it. <laughs> but it was easy because we had already written them for the <laughs> obesity side. That's the North American oh, wow. one. Yes, okay. And um, then I was, uh, I became the, next, the first president of that. And then I was president of the American Society for Clinical Nutrition. Mm -hmm. I was embarrassed when they asked me to be a nominee because I said, but I'm not a nutritionist. <laughs> But um, you well, know, you had done those studies early on for the nutrition, so. But they were, were regulation of appetite, and believe true. it or not, yeah, that's a good point. Nutritionists don't think about regulatory okay. mechanisms of appetite, but they started thinking more. Yeah. Anyhow, I, I uh, headed that as well. Okay. So uh, going back to your your various academic positions, so you uh, left Michigan and you headed to Illinois. So you Southern stick around Illinois. the Midwest for a while. So. Not to my husband's pleasure, but <laughs> <laughs> he did not like Michigan's weather, and uh, Southern Illinois wasn't much better. <laughs> but um, I was invited to be the uh, vice president for graduate studies and research. Okay. And it was a position that I was ready for. I really loved promoting graduate studies, mm -hmm. graduate study, student policy, research policy facilitating research. Mm -hmm. That's what I had been doing a lot of at Michigan. Mm -hmm. So we went there, but I don't know if I should say it because it might be a bad slur, but my husband didn't like Carbondale. <laughs> he was an ophthalmologist and the practice was just too tiny. <laughs> so he told me to look again, and I am very happy that I have a husband who would go wherever, wherever I found the felt. right thing. <laughs> and at that point I was recruited by Ed Brandt to the same position okay. for the University of Maryland, Maryland Baltimore, yes. okay. and Baltimore County. Okay. So I actually reported to two chancellors. Uh, okay. That I do not recommend, <laughs> especially two completely different unrelated chancellors. But um, Johnny Told and President of the System thought it was a great idea. Okay. And uh, I was the only one. <laughs> they, they separated them They separated them, them after yeah, that. It was one of those just good like the graduate ideas. program that was only you in. And then. <laughs> yes, it was a good idea, but it really wasn't the right idea. So, okay. And um, then I moved uh, 12 years ago to University of South Florida, mm -hmm. which I've enjoyed. I enjoyed being there, and I love the Florida weather. <laughs> and You don't uh, miss that Colorado. Michigan weather that you experience at all? Well, I told you, Mason-Dixon line, my husband <laughs> wouldn't let us go above it after after we left Southern Illinois was close, and Maryland just barely made it. <laughs> but. Okay, and so you've obviously had an excellent research productivity, and um, have you trained many graduate students or postdocs? Lots of graduate students and, and seriously more postdocs. Mm -hmm. I've had postdocs mm -hmm. always. In fact, my very first postdoc uh, was a Chinese lady, uh, Kathy Jen, and she came to me, referred to me by uh, someone at Vassar that was already a good friend, and uh, I interviewed her, and at the end I said, well, I want you to know 
I don't understand a word you just said. <laughs> and I'm going to make you an offer because of how enthusiastically you've been recommended. But from this point forward, if I say even one word you don't understand, you have to stop me. And I'm going to stop you every word you say till we get this right. She's become a full professor and a department chair at Wayne. Oh my goodness. Oh, so that's all excellent. I think because I required that she learn to, <laughs> she speak, learned English. to speak English. Yes. She, she was smart, very uh -huh, smart, uh -huh. and she could read English. Mm -hmm. And she thought she was speaking English, <laughs> but she was not. And she's a wonderful colleague and friend and collaborator and has been ever since. So did, was she a graduate student? At, she was a postdoc. A postdoc, you said, mm -hmm. at, at what institution were you? Was that, a, that was while you were at Michigan. That was that my she first came postdoc. And then, right. she, and then she went on to... Um, did Wayne she go to Wayne State. State right from being at there, or did she have transitions? Yes, so, I think mm -hmm. she went straight yeah. there. I think her first appointment was That's at Wayne. Excellent. Yeah. So. But by then I left. <laughs> so did um, did she come with experience working on non-human primates? Or no. Was, no. So you were able to, yeah. she was interested in coming and learning that. And, uh, well, you know, it's interesting. If I were to post an ad and say I want only postdocs that have monkey experience, I wouldn't have any. Yeah, okay. So no, I never have advertised that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think monkeys are such a wonderful subject and I can teach anyone to use mm -hmm. monkeys. Mm -hmm. I want good brains, mm -hmm. good thinking, good ability to re read the literature, understand questions, search for what's known on a particular issue. So And willingness to learn. I've never had someone who had had primate experience before they oh, came to oh, me. Oh, wow. Never. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. But that's, I think, in part because there aren't very many. Mm -hmm. There aren't very many physiologists, certainly not in my three fields, mm -hmm. obesity, diabetes, mm -hmm. appetite regulation, metabolism. There just aren't many. Yeah. And so, yeah. So that's why I don't worry about what they actually know. I just want to know that they're good thinkers. So 2005, what, what drove you to go to uh, University of South Florida? What was it that, what was the big recruitment tool that they used to have? You had been at Maryland for quite an extended 19, period of time, 19, 19 years, years, years right. and so almost feeling like, okay, well, I'm sort of settled here, but something drove you to go to South Florida. Well, it was a collaboration of things or a conglomeration of things, but one of them was that I was collaborating with uh, Bob Faris who is a very well-established um, uh, statesman in the field of uh, endocrinology and islet biology and, and insulin signaling. And he and my postdoc then were collaborating on a particular pathway of insulin okay. sensitivity, insulin secretion. So we agreed to take seven of our monkeys down to his animal facility because he wanted to get live tissues during clamps, during your glycemic clamps. Mm -hmm. We were already experts in clamps on monkeys, and he was an expert on clamps in humans, mm -hmm. but he needed the fresh tissues. So he took seven monkeys down, and he had some place to put them. And I found myself standing in an animal building built uh, specifically for animals with two rooms of mice and 25,000 square feet. Wow. I looked around and hmm, this is There's really interesting here. here. <laughs> and so when the new, I, I, they started recruiting me, but the new dean came. I said I wouldn't move without a dean in place. That's a good piece of advice. <laughs> be sure you know who your dean is. It's going to be your boss. Right? Yes, even if it's going to be your step up uh -huh. boss, mm -hmm. you want to know who that is mm -hmm. and that they're committed to research. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so it was not very long. It took about six months to um, actually make all the agreement and move my NIH grant. Mm -hmm. um, there was a little reluctance of Maryland to give up my <laughs> NIH grant, but NIH was um, very helpful. Okay. That's the best that's, way I can tell you. Excellent. They were very helpful. And so I moved my grants and my funding and my monkeys and my people, mm -hmm. and almost all my people came too. Okay, excellent. And we had a building to ourselves. <laughs> By the time we got there, the mice were gone, so it worked wonderfully. It, we had everything. We had a surgical suite, we had office spaces, you know, cage washer, everything. So it was a great location, and I was landlocked in Maryland, okay. meaning mm -hmm. I, there was no way to push the walls mm -hmm. out or okay. get bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so while at University of South Florida, you were a director of a program on obesity? 
o the oh. OBC Diabetes and Aging mm -hmm. Research Center. Okay. Okay. And it's still there, and we're still getting students and postdocs mm -hmm. and doing a lot of research now in my lab on the tissues and samples we have and, and working on data analysis. And you know what that's like. Right. <laughs> There's a lot of data analysis that you never get to. You never get to. And so exactly. It's, it's so. a good thing about saving it. And, yeah. uh, well, I didn't save it. We, we turned it out all the time, but there were always more. Right, right. but yeah. there's always more. And then now you can yeah. make use of some data that's from that background and yeah. continue to exactly. publish some more papers as you keep going on. So, yes, we love it there. And my family uh, was there. My parents were in Palm Beach, so that's not too far and my brother's in Tallahassee, so okay. there was a Florida draw as okay. well. Okay, all right. And, uh -huh. and your husband was totally fine with living in Florida? Yes, he <laughs> was. <laughs> he liked the idea, so it was a good mess. And, and so who are some of the important people that have really influenced your career, both in terms of your science and in terms of your interest in administrative roles that you've had and in advocacy and stuff like that? So who are some people that have had a really major impact on that. Well, I would say the number one was Elliot Steller. Mm -hmm. And he subsequently, it's very funny because this is something I probably shouldn't tell the video, but I had taken a course in physiological psychology at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And I didn't put together the name of the editor of that book until I was <laughs> in his <laughs> lab. <laughs> uh, I don't know, somehow at least I as a graduate student wasn't very attuned to who the authors were on textbooks. <laughs> but he had written really the physiological psychology book at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know anything about the National Academy of Sciences, of which he was already a member. member. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I mean, it just wasn't on my radar. And um, so he, he was uh, an amazing and never self-serving mentor, always uh, helping me to accomplish what I needed mm -hmm. to accomplish, mm -hmm. always, 100%, always there, and still was long, long after I had left. In mm -hmm. fact, I nominated him for the National Academy of Medicine. Oh, excellent. And oh, that must have made he him was feel very happy really happy about that. He got in on the first nomination. <laughs> Which is very rare, correct? It is, but he was already a member of the well, National Academy of Sciences, <laughs> so true. I won't take much credit <laughs> except for discovering that he should be in. And he was the head of the Committee on Human Rights for the, all of the academies. Okay. And uh, so I've been on it ever since he joined because he was so active in it. And it's a wonderful organization that really looks out for scientists, really of all our disciplines now, because of the three academies, National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering. Mm -hmm. They combine on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, and they really tackle the cases of scientists who are usually prisoners of conscience, people who, uh, for political activism or political viewpoints, have been imprisoned. and. The academies are very, very good at talking with the foreign governments, at you know, rallying people to help uh, free such inappropriately imprisoned people. Mm -hmm. And Elliot really led the flag okay. on that. He was chair of it for some 12 years or something like that. Wow. And of course, his, his postdoc that I went to in Washington really taught me all I knew about monkeys mm -hmm. and let me do what I wanted to do on monkeys mm -hmm. and really facilitated my following Elliot's uh, uh, subject matter. Mm -hmm. And um, the next ones that really made a difference were probably uh, Steve Fiennes and the Diabetes Center at Michigan. Steve Fiennes was a gracious host and a very um, highly respected diabetologist. Mm -hmm. So I got very active in diabetes during my Michigan years mm -hmm. and have stayed mm -hmm. involved in that. Mm -hmm. And then there was the vice chancellor of Southern Illinois University, John Guyon, who eventually became the chancellor, uh, who took a big fling and <laughs> invited me <laughs> to be uh, the vice president for graduate studies and research, which is a position he had held. And I say it was a fling because I was rather young and I arrived wearing kind of a sash over my front, you know, a scarf. Mm -hmm. And about one month later, I wore a button in saying, it's a boy. Oh, <laughs> I arrived pregnant. pregnant. <laughs> I, I arrived pregnant. And uh, 
So <laughs> he kept looking at this and looking at my eyes. <laughs> and I said, oh, it won't matter. And I actually gave out the diplomas two weeks before he was born uh, in May for the, all the PhD students. And John Guyon had to take a great big risk because I was an unknown from the administrative side. And he, uh, I don't know how he decided to pick me out of the group that he had as candidates, but he did, and I'm so glad he did. So had you like seen an ad for the position and applied for it, or was it someone got, contacted you I and said, called. hey, there's this interesting position? Yeah, I got called yeah. and asked if I would consider it. Mm -hmm. I said, well, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> I said that for South Florida, too, by the way, <laughs> because I really wasn't knowledgeable about all the, all the universities. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a great time. Unfortunately, it wasn't very good for my husband's practice. Mm -hmm. So after two years, he said, the five-year plan is on the, on the rocks. <laughs> Pick another place. <laughs> and that's when I made the move to the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. and, so, and Ed Brandt was extremely uh, supportive and a wonderful mentor as well. Mm -hmm. And so what department were you in at Maryland then? Was, physiology. It was physiology. Yes, yes only that's physiology. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. Actually, it was only physiology and psychology mm -hmm. at Southern Illinois, and only physiology. Okay. There was really no psychology mm -hmm. on the Baltimore um, campus. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay. And so, if you had to list some of your most, what you consider your most profound scientific accomplishments. Well, I think the first one is one that ended up in science. Uh, it was the discovery that insulin release under basal fasting, unstimulated conditions, basal insulin, is released from the pancreas in a sinusoidal wave. Not spikes with, mm -hmm. with uh, deterioration, but sinusoidal wave of release. And at the time, it was such a mystery. How do the beta cells across a pancreas this long, scattered in islets, all through the pancreas, and then within the islet, a whole lot of different cells, but just the insulin, not the glucagon or pancreatic polypeptide, just the insulin, was coming out in this sinusoidal wave. And I discovered it really serendipitously because I was looking to try to find out what was in blood that might be signaling the time to eat. Okay. Appetite regulation. Right. And I was doing very rapid blood sampling remotely mm -hmm. from a different room with a monkey asleep. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw this just really clear oscillation. I took it to my endocrine friend and uh, said, look at this. Did you know insulin oscillates? He said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's probably the lighting. <laughs> so we moved to a different room. <laughs> then he had me move, move to the basement and draw <laughs> blood in the basement because he thought it might be some sound stuff or something else. We tried to rule out everything, and basically we ruled out everything, and it really is the way insulin okay. is released. Okay. But I'll tell you why it hadn't been discovered in humans, and that's one of the times I went back to humans and did it myself. So I was going to say that was one of the... They said it wasn't okay. there. Um, Insulin at that time, the assay limit of accuracy was about five microunits per ml. Below that, it wasn't very accurate. And at that time, human basal normal insulin was around five. Okay, so it's just barely that, reaching that. You could barely, you could, you could measure it, but you certainly couldn't measure it accurately, plus and minus 10 or 15 percent, and these mm -hmm. oscillations were 15 to 20 percent okay. of amplitude. Mm -hmm. But monkeys, by sheer chance, <laughs> have uh, a higher. basal insulin of 25. Oh, wow, okay. And so plus or minus 5 to 10 mm -hmm. was really apparent. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take no. <laughs> I said, this is too clear, <laughs> and kept doing more studies to see what was regulating them, what could dis make them disappear, what could amplify them made the discovery that diabetes disrupts them, disrupts okay. that regulation. We don't know why yet, but, we, but that has been repeated in humans in England. I didn't do okay. mm -hmm. the diabetes part, I did the, the basal human part. Mm -hmm. But it was important to use obese people because they do have, have insulin level levels, levels that are, we're well up in the assay. Today it can be done on average normal people, mm -hmm. but at that time the assay wasn't, the RIA reading the assay wasn't good enough. So, so that was kind of the most important, exciting thing. And I guess if I had to name one more, it would be the importance of phase or time. 
Um, I describe what we did in the monkeys as finding that diabetes is a progressive disorder in humans and monkeys that can start early and go fast. So starting your 20s or so, sometimes even the teens today, and you can have it overt by 30 or 35, or starting your 60s and get it overtly by your 80s, and how do you combine those data? And then they're not only starting at different times, but going at different rates. So some progress very rapidly, some progress slowly, mm -hmm. took years, and that went for monkeys and mm -hmm. humans. Mm -hmm. So we developed a way to phase the progression process. So we could take any monkey any time and say where it was in this progression to overt diabetes. Mm -hmm. And then we've applied that to humans as much as we can. You have to have longitudinal data. And most human longitudinal data does not include insulin, does not include IVGTTs, two of which are critical variables, and does not include an insulin sensitivity measurement, which we did always. Mm -hmm. So it was that combination of having the measurements and then measuring them longitudinally and then figuring out that we had to use the accordion analogy and this one are all phase one and this one are all phase eight and what's happening in between can be... Can vary. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, um, and that has made it possible to look at sequence. And you know, up till now, it's been very hard to know. Uh, my favorite question to medical students, where does diabetes begin? I was going to actually ask you what you thought, where you thought and it And then I say, well, at the end of this lecture, I'm going to ask you again, and I want to know, you're going to look now for the genes for diabetes. What organ are you going to look in? What tissue in that organ? What cells in that organ? And what's the control mechanism? And um, that is something that a lot of people don't think about, that these are, that the whole process of getting to diabetes is a longitudinal cascade. Something comes before, and something comes before that. Mm -hmm. And so we have focused constantly on multi-organ changes mm -hmm. across time in the period before overt diabetes. Mm -hmm. And that's been useful both for learning more about diabetes, but also for looking at the complications. Because when I started in this field, most everybody thought the complications of diabetes were due to poor glucose control which meant glucose over 180 or 200. And if people would just behave themselves, right. they would get not get, <laughs> exactly. Get those, soda not. get those soda machines out of the schools. Yes, well, that's one of my favorite pet peeves because that's all nonsense. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that's nonsense, but in the case. Because your non-human primates haven't been drinking colas all their life, huh? <laughs> and, and they still get obese and, they still and get some get don't. No. And they've always been on a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. High fiber, so, low yeah. fat, almost zero cholesterol. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Right. So and we know that. And yet they can still develop diabetes. Absolutely. I think, um, I think we're way off base uh, in, in many of these nutrition uh, fallacies mm -hmm. because they are promoted by the lay public, mm -hmm. by associations. Mm -hmm. And we in physiology know association does not make causation. <laughs> but when you're not in physiology, especially integrative physiology, you forget that just because two things go together doesn't mean one causes the other. Right. My favorite one for my medical students is, did you know gray hair causes diabetes? <laughs> They're linked. <laughs> They're quite well linked because the average onset of diabetes in the 50s and 60s. When you start getting gray hair. <laughs> exactly. But it's a really good um, illustration that we, we have to understand that just finding two associations, like finding high soda intake, mm -hmm. for example, and obesity is in any way causally related. I am certain, certain that it is not. Mm -hmm. And that no amount of elimination of sodas or anything else in the diet, <laughs> unless you take it all away, um, is, is the answer to why we have more obesity. That is just not correct. But it's what is being promoted, promoted right. and a lot of people believe it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people believe the diet composition story, mm -hmm. that if you just ate the right foods, you wouldn't get obese and you wouldn't get diabetes. So <laughs> here are the right foods, A, B, C. I'm happy to say the dietary guidelines this past time came out December 2009. 
2015, mm -hmm. um, have finally noticed that and recognized it. And so they promote the idea of a healthy diet, but not promoting a certain percent of fat, mm -hmm. protein, carbohydrate, don't eat more, don't eat less. Because we know that you can develop diabetes on any diet, unless it's really strange, mm -hmm. like a 2% something or other fat. Mm -hmm. You can't, the far extremes, all bets are off. But for the wide range of diet compositions of ordinary people, there's no effect of composition. And a beautiful study just came out in JAMA on that exact question okay. about two months ago. And they basically proved that the diet composition was neither causal nor preventive. The change of composition alone will not fix diabetes and will not fix obesity. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope someone takes that message away because <laughs> that's, that's the strongest message I have for today. It's, it's not the composition because, you know, as long as we're dealing with the middle 70% of diets that are ingested, Neither of those is doing it in, in the case of obesity and diabetes. It's, it's certainly an increasing problem, but it's an increasing problem because we've, we've ended all the undernutrition. We have very little in the U.S., small amounts elsewhere, some in Africa still, but most of the world no longer suffers under undernutrition. And there are a few places in the world that have malnutrition, usually rice diet or mm -hmm. potato diet or something like that. But in general, in America, it isn't the composition of our diet. And we now have very few who are being restrained mm -hmm. from food availability. And so my, my comment on that is when you have s sufficient food, you express the genes you've been given. <laughs> and we know that humans, and monkeys, believe it or not, have a lot of genetic potential for developing obesity. I, my monkeys are a perfect example because they've, they've, some have gotten really obese. I had a 31 kilogram monkey. And for those not knowledgeable, 10 is about the average, the average. adult. <laughs> and the maximum adult would usually be 15 to 18. The 31 kilogram monkey on the same diet same cage, same care caretakers as monkeys who weighed eight kilograms. That's interesting. And healthy diet, mm -hmm. American Heart Association, recommended diet. And so I think it really says to us that we have, we have a lot of genetic underpinnings that we don't understand. So do you exercise your monkeys? <laughs> I often get asked that. Well, first of all, young adult monkeys are very active. Good point. I'm sorry to tell you, old adult monkeys don't exercise. <laughs> kind of like old humans. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Um, and actually the activity level declines starting in kind of early middle age. And we've done activity studies on the monkeys. Um, interesting, it's very hard to make a monkey exercise because the way you do it is either by applying electrical stimulation, like a cattle probe, which we don't do anymore, or by having them work for treats. Mm -hmm. Well, they won't work for treats if they're fully fed. Right. So you have to deprive them to take them down at least 10 or 15% of their body weight. Then they'll work for treats, you know, on a treadmill. So for those who think exercise is pleasurable, <laughs> Monkeys are smarter than we are, and they know that, nah, I'll just jump around a little, but they don't, um, they, they are naturally active as young animals. Very active as really young, kind of like kids seven, 10 years old are very active. You just look at them, mm -hmm. and, uh, and people yeah, over 50. Kids get, get cold, they, get, they get told that they act like monkeys, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the monkeys, uh, that is really what monkeys do, and, and older monkeys, uh, are very sedentary, and older humans tend to be pretty sedentary as well. So as far as exercise and activity, um, I am not uh, ever a person to say don't exercise, but keep in mind that exercise causes lots of injuries, 
as people know, knees, hips especially, and occasionally falls, breaks, bones. Um, and that exercise is not a very strong pill to slow obesity or diabetes. So exercise if you wish, but uh, take care that you don't overdo it and don't uh, believe that my exercise is gonna fix obesity. The evidence for that is non-existent. Average weight loss with exercise alone as a treatment is about two kilograms. <laughs> And anybody trying to fix their obesity with exercise wants to lose a lot more than that. So, And people do say that maybe it helps people to adhere to a calorie restriction, which is one of the areas we actually did a lot of research on, calorie restriction to promote anti-aging effects. Um, and calorie restriction is certainly uh, a very effective way to stop and promote, uh, prevent diabetes. Absolutely effective, um, but it's not pleasant. <laughs> we had uh, a 23 year study on calorie restriction in our monkeys. Okay. And we adopted a different kind of model than anyone else. We used the model of Mackay who invented calorie restriction in rodents. And we adjusted the amount of food weekly by the weight of the animal. So we did a weight clamp. You know what a clamp right. is, a, a membrane clamp. Well, we did a weight clamp. And the reason we did that was because each animal, A, starts with a different weight, but needs different amount of calories. So some of my co other investigators in the same area tried to fix the diet amount. But if you and I each take exactly the same diet every day, it will have a different effect. You might gain, I might lose, mm -hmm. vice versa. <laughs> so you cannot clamp calories in monkeys or humans and expect to be able to lower body weight unless you literally put them in a prison, right. monkeys or people. So we used the body weight as the feedback mm -hmm. and we simply, on an individual monkey, weighed the monkey once a week and he either got slightly more or slightly less in the way of biscuits. And we did that for 23 years. We started with 10 year olds, uh, around 10 to 12 year old monkeys, and um, they did not get diabetes at all. Oh wow. Not at all, zero diabetes. And wow. the prevalence of it in monkeys is at least 25 or 30%. So, Calorie restriction, yes. Ability to do it, very, very hard for humans to do that. Very small number, and I'm talking less than 100, are successful at personally restricting their body weight, their intake to restrict their body weight and keeping it off. A lot of people, many, 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 can lose. But as the biggest loser story has shown, they regain even though they're utterly motivated. I, I have such sympathy for those who've been on that television program because they work so hard for nine months or a year and they're so proud of losing 100 pounds or 120 pounds. And I'm sad to say the evidence is coming in, recent report, they're all regaining. And some even more. Some of them even were. more. And Guess what, it comes back to my nascence. <laughs> Feeding is a regulated variable. <laughs> and you know, we don't think of it that way. We, don't, we think food intake is volitional. Mm -hmm. It's regulated. I like to say to my medical students, okay, I want you to raise your temperature by one degree. <laughs> no, no, don't get up, don't run around, just sit there, raise it by one degree. Oh, you're having trouble. Well, how about lowering it? Can you fix it down a little bit? Can't do that either, huh? <laughs> well, guess what? Appetite regulation is just as heavily regulated as temperature. It changes with age. So middle-aged people tend to be regulated. They, they're regulated. They're not going up and down or anything, but they're regulated a little bit higher set point. We conceptually call it a set point. We don't know what that is, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of labeling a phenomenon that we see. So I am... Um, I am a very strong believer in calorie restriction, but I am also completely discouraged by the difficulty of doing it, which is why we're studying pharmaceuticals. <laughs> and of course, the best way right now today is bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. 
not something I would advocate for anyone except those that have serious complications of obesity, which is pretty much what the therapeutic index is now in terms of when you should consider it. But calorie restriction is difficult, and most people can't do it. And, and so just out of curiosity, so in your colony that you had for many years, um, did you use both male and female? <laughs> That's a good one. I, I started with only males because I was measuring food intake every day, and I measured food intake every day on our whole colony, 130 monkeys at its peak. Um, and I realized very quickly that the menstrual cycle in a monkey, about, about the same length as a human, 25 days or so, uh, significantly affects the food intake. And they have a menstrual cycle and they gain weight and then they lose weight. So their weight and their intake are both changing across that month. Mm -hmm. And I figured that if we discovered what regulates appetite in male monkeys, we could then apply it to females and it'd probably be the same. So uh, we justified avoiding ma uh, females for the first 10 years or more because we wanted stable intake and stable weight, or at least spontaneously natural weight, so we would know what weight was doing. And then uh, I put in an NIH grant with only males. And guess what? I got told, you've got to add yes, females. Yeah, <laughs> and I said, yes. this is an all-female lab. Only males are technicians. <laughs> Anyhow, I got a big chuckle out of that, but we agreed to gradually increase the ratio of females to males by bringing in more females mm -hmm. uh, whenever we added monkeys. And at our peak, we had about 30% females. Okay. But if you read our papers, many of the papers started on male monkeys and were continued on male monkeys. So, so we have studied more males, but had no difference in the amount of diabetes. That's what I was going to ask. Okay. Not, no difference between males and females, and it's no difference in, in humans either. There really isn't any difference. The age of onset's the same. They're all overweight associated, both humans and monkeys. Of course, the physical dimorphism of monkeys is bigger than that for humans. So a, a female monkey is like half the weight of a male monkey, okay. where in humans it's kind of 25% yeah. less or whatever, right. something yeah. like that. And so you have an even bigger difference, difference. in weight. and. That really bothers taking means. <laughs> what are you going to do? You've got six monkeys in this trial, three females and three males. Whoops, now what do we do? Take this? No. <laughs> so it, it, there are certainly challenges to this issue of um, including sex in animal studies, and I'm very much involved in it. I, I'm not anti it. I just think we have to be very realistic and understand that if we're going to start a study with both before we know even that the target is engageable, for example, that is going to double the cost. Mm -hmm. And some people say more than double it, because mm -hmm. female, I guess female animals are sometimes more, more, expensive. more expensive than male. I rarely bought monkeys, so I didn't, most of my monkeys came through trades or through collaborators mm -hmm. or whatever. But um, that's what I understand, that it will really increase the cost. I want to know about whether there's an effect of being a female versus a male. I think that's really important. But I think you should take the effect and say, okay, so calorie restriction stops diabetes in males. Does it do it in do females? It in female. Exactly. But if, it, if we had tried to do it equal numbers at the time we started, it, it couldn't have continued for 23 years. There wasn't the money to do that. Right. And now that we know it, it's a perfectly good target to look for f female differences. Now, I don't advocate starting 23-year studies, <laughs> but um, uh, calorie restriction is a, a process that you need to go a very long time to know what its consequences are. And the, the biggest loser, weight losers, really showed that as well, that you've really, you've got to follow them even after they lose weight, and even after they try to not regain it. <laughs> Well, for monkeys and cow restriction to prevent diabetes, we had to do the same. We had to really just be patient. And by the way, it stopped everything bad. No hypertension, no dyslipidemia, no excess adiposity. I say excess because even the calorie-restricted monkeys 
changed their composition as they got older. Okay. And I think you would know what that meant. <laughs> it means they had more fat, fat to lean mass ratio. But, um, but they, you know, they did not change their weight because we weight clamped them, which was a strategy we took on that worked. When you try to clamp intake, you have to change it. Mm -hmm. You have to adjust it That's because the body weight changes. Exactly. Because people gain or lose and they don't and they metabolize differently. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep changing that. And that has to be done individually. And that ruins any design for research. Right. <laughs> I mean it's not too cool to say, well, these three went up and these three went down and then there were the three in the middle. <laughs> so so I'm a, a big advocate of learning more about how calorie restriction actually works. Mm -hmm. What is what is the mechanism? And there's been a lot of interest in pharmaceuticals that might act as as calorie restriction mimetics. Mm -hmm. But we don't have one yet. <laughs> we have several potential down the road candidates, but nothing that you know that can act that way. And it is very effective. Stops all the complications of diabetes that's, as well. That's really amazing. That's it's really a amazing. very, very powerful manipulation. It really is. And I wouldn't have known that if we hadn't just kept going. Right. And, uh, yes. Well, you've definitely pursued a, a long career in, in a topic that is obviously extremely important for human medicine as, and for human life as well. So um, tell me a little bit, we're going to go way back now, huh? um, tell me about your first meeting at the American Physiological Society. Oh, I do remember it. I do. I was at, <laughs> I was at Penn, and I went to a FASA meeting in Atlantic City. Yes. <laughs> I'll and students things. today would have no idea what that looked like. And I was all by myself. I knew nobody there. I didn't go with a mentor or anything else. I was just there. And it was overwhelming. All these people and all these rooms to go to. And it was a big, big meeting, even <coughs> in those days. But not a very attractive place <laughs> to have the a meeting. Walk. Yes, the boardwalk was nice. Uh, that was my first one, and um, I think I've come to almost all of them. <laughs> Not quite all of them, but almost all of them. They're, they're a little different now. Huh? Oh, yes, yes. Very comfortable, and very beautiful. Beautifully run, beautifully organized. We don't even have our programs anymore. I do miss my program. <laughs> but uh, it's all in my little cell So phone. APS provides that little one for the, all the APS um, sessions are... Yes. In a oh, they are you in a book. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna yeah. have to they get that book. book. I. Uh, it's a very nice little edition. They did that last year too. Oh well, uh, we'll have to go back to the office and <laughs> pick it up. But I, uh, I use my smartphone. So. <laughs> and so, um, young person coming along and saying, hmm, I might be interested in a career in science. Tell me what advice would you have for that person? Well, I'm remembering the advice I got when I first became an assistant professor. And the first thing a faculty member who was very productive said to me is, don't go on the curriculum committee. <laughs> and don't go on the library committee. And don't go on the parking committee. <laughs> and so I have not served on any of those committees, but I have been active in a lot of committees. But those three uh, I took uh, because they're so time consuming. Um, I much preferred the committees I was on, which were facility committees, um, research committees, practically all the time, uh, committees to decide what, what research needed to be prioritized, mm -hmm. things like that. And I guess if I had a, a piece of advice on how to be successful, it would be get involved in APS. <laughs> Is that enough of a signal? <laughs> APS is, is a very helpful place to, um, to get your roots mm -hmm. together and to learn and meet mentors. And most of my success, if there is some, has been based on collaborators. Mm -hmm. So I've found those collaborators most commonly in meetings, mm -hmm. in scientific meetings. This one, or ADA, or OBC Society. Mm -hmm because other people are always interested in collaborating and they bring to the table new techniques, different techniques, different knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so I have, um, 
I was talking with a faculty member, a junior faculty member, first year assistant professor at USF, just just a couple weeks ago, and he said, well, those other two people, they want my data, but I want to publish it. I said, do you mean you'll be the only author? He said, well, it's my data. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Grab those two who are interested and put your arms around them and figure out your next three papers. <laughs> right, exactly. And, um, I'm hoping he's doing that. He was rather... Uh, nonplussed about my advice because he was trying to keep the wall around the data he had collected. Unfortunately, he collected on his clinical patients, mm -hmm. but with our electronic records, they're in there. <laughs> That's and right. They are not, there's no wall around them from other people. He didn't understand that, no, this is a plus. They each have other strengths, and between you, your collaboration will grow. So I, I have always welcomed and enjoyed collaborations with people from many disciplines. Um, Moshe Levy was here at the reception last <laughs> night, and he and I collaborated on nephropathy. Okay. I didn't know <laughs> anything about neph nephropathy until I met Moshe. I've had collaborations with retinopathy people, mm -hmm. um, and really all the complications. Of diabetes. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I think collaborations are really important. They also bring new ideas. Mm -hmm and new techniques and, and a wealth of possibilities. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think serving on APS committees and coming to EB meetings and stuff like that, not only is it good for science, but it's good for friendships. And, oh, that um, it is. You know, that and um, I've met lots of you know, great people that are friends that I would never have known if it weren't for the involvement with APS, including you. Well, and thank so it's you, been Sue. it's really been fun talking to you and learning more about your research and more about your background. So is there anything else you want to add to to Well I guess um I would still say again that the APS is a really important vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's an important vehicle for being nominated for things. It's mm -hmm. important to get your feet wet and have accomplishments within the society. Mm -hmm to contribute to the society, because society isn't anything, unless its, it's members people. set the agenda, promote the agenda. Um, one of the most effective committees of the APS is the Animal Experimentation Committee, which I've been on for the last four years or so. And it's one of the nationally most effective groups mm -hmm. to promote and protect mm -hmm. the use of animals mm -hmm. in research. Mm -hmm. That that problem isn't going away. Right. We're going to need advocates and people who understand mm -hmm. the other people's viewpoints mm -hmm. and people who can help lay people to understand. To understand it, it yeah. I, I agree with you on that. That's yeah. a really critical committee, and, and APS has got an extremely outstanding reputation in, in, in its advocacy for animal research. Yeah. And, and we actually collaborated on a paper, right? We did. <laughs> so, we did. So, so uh, yeah, I think... Um, also, it really is a great policy area because mm -hmm. there's some, so much misunderstanding mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and the lay papers are so poor on handling uh, uh, animal research. And I guess the other thing I would say is if you're doing animal research, put it out there. Mm -hmm. Be public with it. Mm -hmm. Let the reporter interview you. Mm -hmm. Let them t put a picture of a monkey as long as it doesn't look sick. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't abuse the system. But a picture of a monkey and say what's being learned mm -hmm. from the monkey because we have to protect animal research and lay people are not going to because they don't understand mm -hmm. that it's underlying virt virtually all scientific advance in biomedicine. Right, and I think your research showing the relationship between similarity of disease processes in monkeys and humans is obviously a really extremely strong point for why we need to support animal research because obviously yeah. you couldn't manipulate the humans. Like you said, they wouldn't let you put those things into them. You know, that, been, right? <laughs> and um, and it can be done very humanely. I mean, right. we've Absolutely. Always, we've never oh my God. Yeah. Be tortured or pain, pain, left right. pain, in pain right. or anything right. like that. Right. No. So. No. That would. You know. The the thing about that is, why would somebody want to do that to their animals? Their research wouldn't be valid because yeah. it's it's the fact that we do do it fairly and. And appropriately, that it's valid results and valid physiology. So. I think the perceptions out there have nothing to do with the reality. Correct. As to how animals are being used. I mean, we anesthetize the monkeys mm -hmm. and we take care of them after they are waking up mm -hmm. and we wait till they're really awake mm -hmm. and we 
treat them just like you would a human. I was going to say it's hot it's pad <laughs> to keep them warm and and a heat lamp if we can't be with pad anymore because they're waking up too much. So those kinds of things um, I think we need to share mm -hmm. with the lay press, mm -hmm. and I think we have to be more out there. Mm -hmm. People have been cowering down. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want to talk about my animals because PETA might come. Mm -hmm. But we really need all of us who use animals mm -hmm. to talk to the lay press mm -hmm. about it. Right. Increase the understanding, the general understanding that they really are critical. And of course we have to talk with our congressmen. Right. right. And their staffs. Mm -hmm. Their staffs are just as important, by Correct. the way, right. in terms of being sure um, bills that unduly and inappropriately restrict animal research are, are not uh, allowed to go forward. Right, right, yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for participating in the APS's Living History, and um, I hope you've enjoyed having this little conversation today. I always enjoy being with you, so thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks.